On a gray spring morning in 1536, George Boleyn was led across the dew-soaked grass to a scaffold on Tower Hill. Sentenced to die under trumped-up charges of treason and incest, the ardent reformer faced the gathering crowd. After an acknowledgment of his sins, George offered a, lex a last exhortation. Men do come and say that I have been a setter forth of the word of God, and one that have favored the gospel of Christ. And because I would not that God's word should be slandered by me, I say unto you all that if I had followed God's word indeed, as I did read it and set it forth to my power, I had not come to this. It made for a poignant, if unsurprising, ending. The courtier known for his reformist beliefs chose his last moments on earth to extol one of the movement's clearest tenets. He was indeed a setter forth of the gospel in more ways than just this final speech. George Boleyn's promotion of Protestant ideals via the spread of religious books, his presentation to convocation, and diplomatic assignments abroad served to influence Henry VIII and advance the king's efforts to disconnect from the pope and establish the Anglican Church. The prior century's advent of the printing press, along with diminishing book prices and increasing literacy rates, enabled religious philosophers to transmit their works to reformers like George more efficiently than ever before. As the middle class expanded, demand for religious tracts in the vernacular grew, and progressive scholars were only too happy to fill the need. As these books and pamphlets filtered out, of the cities and into nearby villages and towns, they began to spread across the continent. Religious leaders sought to curb the distribution of what they saw as dangerous, heretical books with suppression acts. But intrepid reformers rose to the challenge, finding new ways to smuggle their goods off the mainland and into the hands of England's burgeoning crop of anti-clericals. Just how these books found their way into the Boleyn Library is unclear. Regardless of its origination, one of the pamphlets entered the king's possession and left an indelible mark. Through Simon Fish's work, A Supplication for the Beggars, George Boleyn encouraged Henry VIII's mind toward the idea of breaking with Rome. History has credited Anne Boleyn for the king's consumption of supplication, but the idea originated with her brother. Martyrologist John Fox recounts George's earnest plea for his sister to share the tract with her paramour. The king was so taken by Fish's condemnation of the clergy's idleness and exploitation, he couldn't bear to part with the pamphlet for several days. Fish argued the church's power was such it did not matter what laws the king made against the clergy. The pope could simply overrule them. The church wielded control over the people and thus the country. For Henry to reclaim his sovereignty, he needed to weaken the church's influence. Faced with an uphill battle against the pontiff for his divorce, the king welcomed this view as a possible way out of his troubles. George further promoted the cause of the Reformation by translating evangelical works into English for the indoctrination of Queen Anne's ladies, transforming the royal household into a conduit for reform. Your most loving and friendly brother sendeth greetings, he wrote in his dedication of the Ecclesiastes. Paired alongside his translation of Jacques Lefebvre de Topps, Epistres et Evangelium, Gilles, <laughs> de Sicant et du Setma de l'An, these two sumptuously decorated manuscripts preached reformist doctrine and were meant to be displayed in the queen's rooms so her ladies could read and take instruction from the teachings contained within. Queen Anne was well acquainted with Lefebvre de Top through her childhood in the French court and emphatically agreed with his view on the saving role of faith in Christ and the evils inherent in the church. Despite increasingly restrictive laws and heretical books, the queen consistently imported them from abroad for public display. She required her ladies to read and conform. And this is the said book. 
Beyond the confines of scripture, George contributed to the progress of English culture by circulating pro-feminine themed books among an inner circle of prominent young men at court. Housed in the British Library today, the 15th century manuscript of Les Lamentations de Matthiolus and Les Livres de Lys still contains traces of its route through court poet Thomas Wyatt and the popular musician Mark Smeaton. Smeaton's inappropriate exchanges with Queen Anne during the weeks prior to their execution supports the assertion that George bequeathed the book as an entreaty for the musician to amend his ways. While Lamentations was notoriously misogynistic, Liva de Lis, the rebuttal by Johann de Lefebvre, argued against women's alleged fickleness and cruelty. Lefebvre was inspired by Christine de Paisan's The Book of the City of Ladies, a feminist treatise that celebrated women's rights to education and respect and their ability to rule. De Paisan's teachings had been deeply ingrained in Queen Anne from an early age. While she taught it in her household, George spread it throughout the ranks of men with the potential to codify it into law. My listeners, note well this point, his inscription urged readers, the new quashes the old way of thought. George's knowledge of scripture and his ability to successfully argue its points as a representative of the king directly aided the passing of the Act of Supremacy. Though it entered the law books three years after George's 1531 appearance at Convocation, the legislative meeting of church leadership, it was the courtier's proposed addendum, as far as the law of Christ allows, that swayed the clergy into submission to the king's supremacy. George arrived at Convocation armed with religious tracts he wrote based upon the king's own work, the glass of truth, and the Collectania Satis Copiosa, which supported the king's position. Both provided divine sanction for the title Henry desired, supreme head of the English church. George's speech still exists as the Rochford Manuscript. In this, the courtier served not only as a theological scholar, but also as the king's propagandist. Convocation would not be his only parliamentary appearance. George Boleyn's high rate of attendance during the Reformation Parliament of 1529 to 1536 ensured his input and influence upon nearly every major piece of reform legislation. Indeed, he claimed the second highest attendance for a lawmaker. And amongst his many returns was the 1533 meeting that outlawed appeals to Rome. Additionally, George submitted votes for acts which saw the transfer of authority from the Pope to the King, the right of the Anglican Church to make dispensations, and the investiture of the succession of his niece, Elizabeth. The act of succession was a particularly sharp weapon in the King's arsenal. Everyone in the realm was required to pledge an oath renouncing foreign authority, including that of Rome. It also required recognition of the validity of King Henry's marriage to George's sister and the legitimacy of their heirs. To abstain was a treasonable offense that meant imprisonment or death. You know, I had to put something funny in there. 